Hello everybody, welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of City Talk in association with Red FM. This week we are going to cover the academy team, the women's teams and the amputee team. So I'm delighted to have our first guest on today, Liam Kearney, the new head of academy. How are things, Liam? Welcome. Good, Paul. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. No problem. So look, we'll give, I suppose, give him. I'm sure uh, all City fans know you too well, but just to kind of give a background, obviously you were a, a, a very prominent player for the club in the past, um, and you know, then you moved into the kind of the coach and side of things soon after you finished playing. How has that been, the transition from playing to coaching? Yeah, it's been one, I suppose, towards the end of my playing career that I kind of had a feeling that it's something that I was interested in. And, um, you know, I was lucky. I, I actually finished, when I finished playing, I went to America for a year and had good full-time coaching experience there. And, and luckily when I came back, John Caulfield asked me to come in and join the backroom team with himself and, and John Carter and Lisa Fallon. So I suppose... I've been lucky to get the opportunity that I did so quickly um, out of playing. So, um, you know, it was obviously great then to enjoy the bit of success with the club from the yeah, playing yeah. and the coaching point as well. So, yeah. yeah. And the, that, that seemed to be something that kind of was there under John Tenure that he always kind of had a young coach that I suppose wasn't long out of play. And I think Billy Woods was in, involved for a while. Then yourself, I suppose maybe he saw it as maybe a close connect between, you know, a player who's recently finished with the management team, it's probably not a bad, it's not a bad idea, is it? No, definitely. I suppose um, even when, when I was playing under John, he probably knew that I'd be someone who would have an opinion if we were doing video analysis or, you know, um, had, a, had an opinion on certain things. And I suppose he respected that point of view. So, no, look, I suppose um, it was just, it was nice to get the opportunity, as I said, from, from such an early point. And I suppose the more time you have, uh, under your belt from the coaching standpoint you 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 improve your own coaching style as well yeah and uh while you were also a coach with the first team you were also manager of the the under 17 team at the time what year would that have been liam um so i think the first season that um i was just with the first team so yeah. it was the following year that i came in with the first team that i took on the 17s and so i was in it for two two years then after that Excellent. So that was great. It was great. It was nice. To, it was it was full on to be honest with the first team. I think going coaching in the evenings and you know from washing kit to organising stuff. It was. But then you know it's great learning curve for me too. And you know I understood what it meant and how how hard you had to work to do the job. You know. Yeah, I think I remember speaking to you around the time. Um, you know, some days you're coming back for, on a Friday from Dublin or whatever, and you're back up the country again on the Saturday. It sure wasn't a, an easy slog, but it sounds like you enjoyed it. Yeah, listen, that, that was the job. I knew what I was getting into. And as I said, look, you know, uh, work with the young lads, it, it's just great reward in terms of watching players develop and improve as, as the season goes on. And, and, you know, I suppose at the end of the day, if it's what you want to do, then it's worth the work. Absolutely. And I suppose, look, last year you, you, you took, a, took a step away from the club and uh, you weren't directly involved in the club anymore. But... Um, the way things panned out, Colin stepping up to, to be the first team manager, uh, and obviously a vacancy became available with the through the head academy role, and you know it's I think everyone you know at the club is delighted to have you back as the head of academy. How how did you feel yourself? You know coming back into that role is it something you're excited about? Yeah, definitely. I suppose um, I would have spoken to Colin over Christmas time, and, and and as things kind of developed for him. Obviously, the position became open to come in and, and, you know, it was a no-brainer for me, I suppose, as part of my coaching progression too. I've, I've been a coach with first team. I've managed with the academy team. So it was probably the next step for me in terms of taking on the overall head of the academy. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. Obviously, at the moment, it's a difficult time with, with COVID restrictions and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of planning, a lot of organising. Um, at the moment, so we just can't wait to get a, get get going. Yeah, and we had Colin on the, the podcast previously um, around this time last year as a head of academy, um, and you know he had his own ideas and his own way of kind of running the academy and his ideas behind it. But I'm sure you're coming in here now with your own your own ideas and um, you know your own strategy. Is that something that you've kind of been working on since you've come back? Um, I suppose the big thing, I suppose, throughout the academy towards the first team would be that we're all aligned along the same ideas. I mean, myself and Colin, I'm, I'm not going to be changing the wheel 
uh, in terms of how we do things within the academy, it'll be along the lines of, of what Collins worked on yeah. because at the end of the day, we want to progress the players through our academy into the Collins first team. So in lots of ways, we, we'll be working closely together in terms of our ideas will be very similar um, because I suppose as, as players develop and progress, we want them to be understanding so that if they do get brought into the first team that it's not going to take Colin four or five weeks to, to bring him up to speed in terms of you know, movements, rotations, whatever it is within the first team style of play. Yeah, and um, I suppose just just kind of on that point, really, you know, it's something that's a little slightly different from Colin's reign. He actually managed the under-19s while he was the head of academy. You've taken the, the decision to kind of step back from that and kind of oversee all the teams rather than, you know, obviously Colin oversaw all the teams, but you know, not being directly involved in the team. Was that a conscious decision you made coming in? Yeah, look, I suppose it was something I looked at and even speaking to Colin, um, just in regarding it too, I suppose it's important that you, you're able to get a good overall view of how each team is doing. And, you know, if a coach is missing some nights for whatever age group that you can fill in and, and do a session in, in, in that way. So you're kind of a cover for any age group, you know, that I'm obviously going to be there if someone is, is away but also just getting an, an overview of how players are developing within each team rather sometimes if you if I felt if you're in with one team sometimes you can get completely bogged down in, in that particular team and I think as a um, head of academy it's important that you can you can see the bigger picture and luckily enough I, I'm very lucky that we have such strong coaches and, and management teams within the academy so you know I, I suppose I kind of oversee them if there's something they need and they're for them obviously we're all working off the same kind of methodology, methodology, sorry, and philosophy within the academy. And again, it's aligned with the first team. And I think that's very important. Yeah, and I suppose just for people who might be aware of the, the current management setup within the academy, obviously there's the under 14s, 15s, 17s, and 19s. Do you want to take us through the kind of briefly the management structure or the management team at each level? Yeah, so I suppose. You look at our, our fifth or four teams, you know, how we how we are we are set up is basically you have a manager, coaches, um, video analyst video analysis, easy for me to say, and you've got um strength and conditioning coaches. So each uh, management group would have that. Obviously, Greg's with Greg Gelberton's with the four teams, very highly experienced coach, has his pro license. You've Steve Birmingham has come in with, with Colin Birmingham with with the 15s. Again, usually experienced um a licensed coach with 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 the 15s um under 17s then we've with dave moore with his backroom team who have done great work and has he's stepped up with the 17s for the season ahead again fantastic coach really good um and obviously 19s then we've the huge experience of dan murray alan bennett stephen Beatty, um, and you know you go through all the all the even the strength and conditioning coaches we have throughout the academy now they're really really qualified you know we've Paul Howard in with the 19s um vastly experienced and video analysis we've actually got a head of video analysis in which is Paula Donovan who yeah. is, um again excellent excellent uh, at what he does and he's kind of overseeing all our video analysis then throughout so look we're we're we're, we're well equipped in that in that regard we, we have good management teams in place I suppose as I said already, it's at the moment there's a lot of Zoom calls and a lot of um, fitness testing that they're doing themselves at home. So, look, hopefully when when things improve, we'll be able to get back on the pitch and, and really get going. Yeah, I suppose at the time of recording this, there's still kind of no update on when the season is you know going to kick off and and when you're going to be back. But the hope that is it's going to be very soon, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I suppose we we haven't any. Definite answer. Um, I suppose the FBI are still working off government guidelines and hopefully once they change, we, we'll be back sooner rather than later. But look, at the moment, I, I, I suppose the important thing is that our, our, our players are in good mental health. Um, you know, it isn't easy. A lot of these players have nearly been six months now without playing a game, if not longer. So it's a long time in player development for a player not to be able to train or play in such a long period of time. So Initially, it'll just be good to see lads back training with a smile on their face and, and we'll go from there. Excellent, excellent. I suppose, look, it's, it's probably giving you a bit of more time as well to put more of your stamp on it, you know, before the season does get going, that little bit of time. So I suppose there's always a, a slight silver lining on that one. But going back to the point um, a while ago, just kind of on the progression of players to the first team, 
you know, obviously with an academy, that's that's the entire goal really of having an academy is progressing to players to the first team. Again, is is that something that you're constantly liaising with coaches to have a certain style of play or you know, obviously, look, each manager, each coach is going to be different. Do you give the kind of free reign and say, look, you know, I'll leave the manager kind of judge on the group of players that he has? Or are you kind of, you know, like a strict on, you know, they need to play a certain way, a certain formation? How, how does that work? I suppose what we have within the whole academy now is we, we will have a structure of style of play. So all our coaches and management teams understand how we want to progress. Um, I suppose from... 14s, 15s, you're instilling the initial uh, style of play. And obviously, as you get to 17s and 19s, you start going into more detail of uh, the structure and the different rotations and movements within that style. So I suppose it's streamlined really towards how the first team play. And I think it's important that we have a structure in place where from 14s to 19s, everyone understands you know, the style of football that we want to play. Obviously, it'll be possession-based football. Um, with with a guide in line with the first team. So, um, no, look, all the coaches understand, for me, we're, we're developing footballers. Obviously, we all would love to win leagues and everything like that, but in the academy, for me, the most important thing is that we're creating footballers for the future of the club. So whether we win the league, great, brilliant, but the biggest, biggest thing for the club and the biggest thing for me as uh, head of the academy is that we're developing good young footballers that are composed can get on the ball and play play the right way. Yeah, and I suppose, look, there's been some fantastic work done over the previous years in the academy, and I think it's, you know, it's coming to fruition already with the amount of players that have progressed through to the first team last year. We touched on it in last week's podcast, and also kind of players looking to do the same for the coming year. You know, it's, it's great to see. It's great to see the, the academy system in play. Um, I suppose, you know, the whole academy it's littered with Irish underage players just goes to show the great work that's that's been done um, I suppose Liam can you give us your kind of I suppose three main goals as head of academy like your three kind of top aims I suppose of, of, of being a head of academy and what you want out of it um, I suppose when we talk about developing players we really mean developing towards the first team now as an academy to, to hopefully kind of be self-sustainable eventually you're looking at maybe selling players as well within the academy I know a lot of players now have agents um, obviously Briggs has come in where unless they have some English um, relation or something they won't be able to go to England until they're 18 which in lots of ways is good for us as well as a club because it means we're, we're more opportunity to keep players longer um, and hopefully develop an, into the first team so the biggest goal always would be that we're developing players to bring into our first team if not sell them to English clubs or foreign clubs. It's also having players playing for Cork City that understand what it means to play for Cork City, understands the club, understands the pride that should be put in, in, in wearing the jersey um, and the work rate, I suppose. You know, in the day, we've had Colin, who's now the first team manager, there's no better man to understand what it takes to become a, a, a senior player, to become a consistent senior player. That's another thing as well that, you know, you get into a first team and you think you've made it. No, it's how hard you work once you're in there is what keeps you there. So I suppose putting that mentality into players, I mean, you know, we train three nights a week with our teams. You know, they have the best of, of, of facilities in terms of CIT. We have the backroom teams where, you know, your strength conditioning, your video analysis. So we have as much as we can give the players to improve. Um, so that, I suppose that, that would be the big thing is that, you know, we have players that understand what it means to be at Cork City and understand where we want to go with it. Great stuff. And I suppose, Liam, you are really a, a, an ideal person for the role in the, in the sense that you were, a, you were a player who went over to Nottingham Forest when you were, I don't know, was it 6, 15, 16? <laughs> you, you've come back, you've played at a great level, you know, for your whole career um, and had success and stuff like that. You, I suppose, in your role, just kind of outside of, you know, the, the coaching aspect and the systems and, and that stuff. And I, I suppose you will be there as a guide as well for the academy players where there is maybe interest from outside of the country or across the water or in Europe or wherever it may, may be. I'm sure your, your own experience will, 
will blend hugely for in their decisions and you can guide them having been through it but i suppose there's always pros and cons and the argument has been there for the last couple of years or is a player better off going across when he's younger or staying or vice versa and, and we've had you know we like say yourself now we've had joe gamble roy o'donovan you know players like that on the podcast previously who've gone through that experience what, what's your own personal point on point of view on that um i suppose when i long time ago now when i was 16 so um i suppose what what was in Cork and in Ireland at the time is it was completely different to what we have now in terms of you know the development pathway within Cork City Football Club, even within the League of Ireland. It's it's after coming on leaps and bounds. Um, I suppose when talking to a, a young player that we'll have in the academy now, and when the opportunities come knocking in terms of you know English clubs are looking for him to sign, you know I suppose all I would be doing is giving my opinion based on my, my own experience. I had a great experience when when I went to England. And, you know, there was times where I was very lonely as a player, you know, missed home and everything like that. So you kind of have to speak to the parents, but obviously the player will have his own feeling and, and what he wants to do. And I would never stand in, in someone's way if, if that's what they wanted to. But I suppose what we have now in Ireland and at Cork City is a really, really good development plan to bring players into our first team. And from, from me personally, I look at the likes of Kevin Doyle who never went to England, played through Cork City's first team and got his opportunity at a later date. So, you know, I suppose it's, it's, it'll suit some players. It might suit other players to stay here longer or, you know, so it's very an individual basis. But for me, all I can say is what we can offer and what we're doing and what we're doing to improve as a club, as an academy. And look, we're, we're very lucky. We've got some really talented players in our academy now. And um, so you can imagine there is becoming year by year a lot more interest as well from, from abroad. Great stuff. Uh, Liam, thanks very much for that. And it's great to get a, a quick kind of overview on, on yourself and, and, and how things are going and, and the plans for the future. Just a couple of quick questions, I suppose, um, that have come in for yourself uh, in relation to your role in the academy. Uh, the first one there is, I suppose, the challenges for a player going from the academy into the first team. What are the difficulties in that? I think it's 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 a huge step up from academy from under nineteen level and to the first team. I think it, they're going from a basically underage team, obviously, into a physically senior team. Who you know the intensity of training, the intensity of matches, and what's at stake. I suppose in the academy we're developing players for the future. So when they get to the first team, now it becomes a, a results based business. So there's a lot more at stake. There's a lot more pressure. I mean, in normal circumstances, you've been playing in front of big crowds, you know, again, representing Cork City, you know, it's, it's a big weight as much as an honour to, to, to be going out there performing and having to win matches and the pressure of winning matches. So there's a huge, huge step up. Um, we try our best to prepare our players to do that. I think, you know, there's a lot of boys get brought into first team training just to get a feel of what the level is. And sometimes you get a gauge even from training whether a lad can actually cope with it, whether he's comfortable living in that environment. And um, so, yeah. Great stuff. Um, but the next question actually was it just on your previous experience, whether the players just stay or go, but we've touched on that already. Uh, the, the next one came in and said, um, obviously the FBI have made huge improvements um, with the structures over the last couple of years, with the 13s, now 14s, 15s, 17s, 19s players being in, you know, top professional setups from a very young age, which is can only bode well, I feel anyway. But is there any other improvements you think that can be made within Ireland, within the structure, I suppose maybe even within the club? Do you know, do you see anywhere that there's maybe a gaping hole or is it kind of a, a continuous battle to improve all areas? Um, I suppose we're, we're very lucky in Cork in terms of like we get our underage players basically from the Cork School Bike Clubs and they've been very good in terms of their developing players. When we get them, they're at a very good level anyway. Yeah. So from our point of view as a club, I think we probably can improve our relationships with Cork School Bike Clubs um, and in terms of players reintegration back into their clubs or players coming into our club at a later age as well. So. We're always trying to build relationships with, with, with local clubs here and around Munster, because obviously we have players coming from Kerry, Waterford, you know, top players around, around Munster. So for me, though, the biggest development for me will be how we close that gap from under-19s to the first team. I, I do feel that 
you know, we need some sort of league that, you know, we have players that are 19 years of age that aren't physically ready to play first team, but they have potential to do so maybe in another year or two. So the biggest improvement that is needed is how we get another league, whether it's a reserve league, whether it's playing, as I, I once said about playing in the Munster Senior League as it for a team, but it might not be a gore, but there needs to be some link from 19s to the first team because it's a huge jump and some players physically, even mentally, might not be ready for it yet. That's not to say that down the line they, they won't be, you know? Yeah, you know, Liam, look, that's, that's fantastic. I, 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 you know, you've covered a lot of points there and made a lot of great points as well. So I suppose just to say, kind of continue with the great work, best of luck with your new role and um, hopefully we'll see the fruition of it over the next couple of years. Cheers, Paul. Thanks very much. So that brings an end to part one. Uh, up next on part two, we'll be speaking to Ronan Collins, the women's senior manager. Thanks again, Liam. Then welcome back to part two of City Talk podcast, season two, episode two. I'm delighted now to be joined from the women's team, senior manager Ronan Collins. Welcome, Ronan. How are you doing, Paul? All going well? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you for coming on. Um, look, delighted to kind of get into all things kind of um, from the Cork City FC women's team today, both for the senior team and I suppose the, the underage structures and stuff like that. Um, all kind of going well in the game at the moment. Yeah, no, I suppose we're, we're really lucky at the moment that we're getting out to train and play matches. So it's keeping busy, you know, that, that silly season is kind of gone and it's now hard work and head down. And, you know, so I suppose with seniors, we're obviously out and in with the underage sections trying to get home programs done and whatnot for them, keep the players fresh and ready to go for the season. So, um, busy, <laughs> busy. Good. Good stuff. I suppose, look, we'll, we'll come around kind of to where our things are at at the moment, but I just wanted to first of all touch on kind of last season and how how last season went for the whole kind of women's section, not just the senior team, but also the under-17 team also had a lot of uh, success. So, um, I suppose, look, starting off with yourselves, finishing in a great position fourth in the league you know I know you put a great run together throughout the season there getting to the women's cup final obviously look that didn't go the way you planned but um, you know a great effort in itself getting to the cup final versus a very strong PMO team and then the, the women's under 17s picking up the, the the cup then you know um, so not a bad season at all for the, the women's section no, no, and like I think for years we've been kind of showing that growth as well. Even like if you go on results, even I think over the last seven, eight years, the senior team has you know finished ahead of where it did the season before, and that's true. A lot of different people, both management, coaches, players. So I think one really good thing about the club is how everyone's kind of building on top of the work that came before, and I think all the players can see that that like every year, whether it be whatever little bit is brought in and everything we had is maintained. So. That continuous progression is a is a really good thing, but I, I suppose the higher you go, the the harder those gaps get and those margins get. And you know, last year there was a real uh, the the effort the players made was humongous, but um, that's now money in the tank. But we've got to push on again from there. But no, it went really well. It was I think one thing we always talk about as well is creating really good experiences for the players. You know, with everything and. I think the players had a really good day and through all the sections, you know, they really gained a lot out of the season, whatever about league finishes and cup finals and the 17s obviously being really successful as well. It's, I think the players gained a lot of experience from it. We're, we're obviously extremely young, you know, so um, that's a really important part of it. But um, that's the point in the journey we were at then. That's now in the back window and we have to kick on for this year again as well. But no, um, I suppose in in particular, like the league, we we set out, you know, to I suppose it's very competitive around our part of the tables, you know, and I think especially in the games against the teams around us, we performed really well in those matches, and they were key matches. But that's it's a real challenge then for this season that we have to go and replicate that again. And um, I suppose the cup final, and it was a great run, you know, it was. It was a really good experience. I, you know, obviously, the final was a disappointment how the second half went, but I think the girls, I, I really liked how they handled it throughout the week and even by the first half of the performance, I think it showed um, they had no fear, you know, and they, they did play with that confidence. So 
as we said, we were halfway there, so we just need to get there again so we can do the second part of it, you know. Um, 17s, I think one thing, and I think this is throughout the club, and you even see it in the boys' side as well, you know, it's our promotion of youth and how we back youth and the structures that are put in place for young players in the Cork and Munster region is terrific. Like, um, So I'm not surprised to see the 17s having the success because... I think when we would have come in about three years ago, I think there was one academy player in the senior setup. I think we're now at 16, 15, 16 players. So for that to increase over three years, it's it, I think it shows the quality of work that's done throughout, you know, the whole club and really developing those players. And it's funny, even when we have younger players coming up into the senior team, they know the Cork City way to play, you know, you can see it in the men's team as well, that very much, you know, getting the ball, have high pressure, you know, play with a real intensity, but move the ball really well as well. So it's great when you see the younger players coming up and that's what they want to do as well. And like, obviously those senior players are now starting to become that bit older and you can see it's really filtering through the whole squad as well. So that's a real positive. So, the 17s were great, but I, what I really enjoyed myself most, because you can enjoy the 17 the matches a bit more than the seniors, <laughs> is really watching how they play. And yeah, I, I yeah. think there's a lot of credit through to the staff on that. Obviously, our academy underneath that, so our, our junior and senior academy underneath the 17s are growing all the time as well. And they were on Fridays and Sundays last year. And even watching the standard of play and that and coming on, it's, it's great that girls are getting those opportunities, I suppose. Now... Big one we always say is young girl in Cork now, 11 and 12. You can train with your club. You can train with the emerging talent. You can train with the Centre of Excellence and you can come in and train with Cork City Academy. Yeah. For girls to be getting, and that is very similar opportunity to what boys get in Cork, for them to be getting those opportunities now, it's it's great. It's taken a while, but now in 2021, that's what we're being able to provide here and it's terrific. Great. Yeah, and it's something that it just kind of struck me when you were, Speaking about, you know, and Liam touched on something similar for the boys progressing into the, the senior men's team, you know, having a philosophy, having a style of play. But, uh, you know, like, you know, people wouldn't see this on a day to day basis, but I'd see it, you know, being out and around the Bishopstown, you all work extremely close together. You know, you'd always see yourself and Sarah Healy and Jess Law and then all the staff, you know, working together in tandem, whether it's helping each other with training sessions or, you know, planning or meetings or whatever it is you're always working very closely you know which will like you say when you're going to watch the games whether it be the women seniors or the underage you can see a very similar pattern developing with all the with all the age groups and it's, it's great to see yeah we, we we've uh, we've a good way of sucking people in paul you're <laughs> i know that well so you kind of get trapped and then you're kind of stuck in the that's bishop's town do you know uh, that's it so, I suppose it's great that level of support that you have and we'll call it support for the time being. You know, <laughs> you know I, I, I think the environment there is really good. You know, it's something everyone wants to be around. I think we're really lucky to have a home like Bishopstown as well, where everyone's, you know, is one group, you know, whether it be like even we had our senior game the last day and to be able to get feedback from 17 coaches, such as let's say Sarah or Mick would have had calls with me during the week and stuff they think. Yeah. which is brilliant to be able to get that feedback where at times you can be standing too close to what's going on and yeah. you know, someone can maybe tell you to cop on every so often on whatever the point might yeah, be. Yeah. Like even flipping that on, even to things like the men's team, like I'll often, Colin will come in with a little nugget on something he's seen. Like, I you know, he would have played against Pats there recently and there were some ideas he's passing on to us as well, you know. And... Yeah. Um, Stealing, I know Liam, Liam has helped us out with one or two roles we've been able to fill this year as well. So, you know, that communication across, I, I do feel the women more than carry their weight as well in other ways that, of what we bring. So it's yeah. it's just a brilliant community to be involved with. But like, that is Cork City. You know, that's 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 our strength. And I think we've got to play to our strengths. Great. And just told you two things you touched on there as well was, um, you know, the obviously the... The, the, the junior academy I suppose that you have set up at the moment for the girls it's, that might be something that not too many people might know about but just gives a kind of a bit of a rundown on that so it's basically a kind of a, a no commitment academy I suppose really like you know you don't have underage teams for that age but you, no. you bring players out and put them through coaching and, and 
you know, the professional setup and stuff like that. So it's, it's a fantastic opportunity for girls. Is, is it age between kind of 13 to 16 or 12 to 16? Yeah, it's kind of, is it 11, I think we're at now? So right. kind of, we're kind of dropping it further because yeah, yeah. facilities and coaches are expanding and stuff as well. So, yeah, it's just an extra opportunity for girls to get out and train and play football. Really, like, if you want to be a good footballer, play it a lot, you know? Yeah, when yeah. you know, play the challenges. So, yeah. I think that's really what we wanted to bring to it. I think also that kind of community and that, you know, people really start to see Cork City as their club. I remember, you know, there was there was a board member I remember talking to and he would have mentioned when the women originally came on board that, like, he would have had a daughter and his daughter never had the opportunity of representing Cork City up until those few years ago, whereas now, from 11 years of age, they can come in and, you know, they can they can wear the crest and, you know... I know last year, Paul, I would have been dealing with yourself and gear for the academy and even something as simple as yeah. now we have 150 girls under the age of 15 walking around Cork who are proud to be Cork City players as well, you know, and exactly. I think that's just brilliant. I think it's terrific, you know, um, the junior academy as well. It's funny, um, I think um, I used to be the academy manager and obviously I'm now, you know, with the seniors. Um, Jess Lawton, our 19s manager, was our academy manager last year and our previous academy manager to Jess was Sarah. So obviously progression. you can see that progression pathway with the players. Obviously, I was saying we now have 15, 16 of our senior squad who are ex-academy players. <laughs> you see that progression with the coaches as well. And like I know one thing we've had a conversation about with with like females need to see female role models and I suppose in the Cork area and one thing about the women's national league that's great is like it's senior national league or it's senior international playing in the league yeah. you know it's, you know with, whether it be with us we have you know Ava Zara who's senior caps you know but even now so girls can see that but they now need to start seeing female coaches as well and with the likes of Jess and Sarah Anya Donovan obviously as well that we're starting to produce that now as well. And I think the academy is really starting to become a hub where, you know, those female coaches can start to get that exposure as well. Yeah, so that was the other thing I was going to touch on is just the, the obviously the introduction to the under-19 team. It just adds that extra step in the ladder, like, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. It, it, it was definitely required. Like, we were, we were at a spot where, you know, we, we need those more. The league needs to keep growing, you know, yeah. I think. I think from the women's national league point of view, there's been a lot of really good steps, especially made over the last year. And you know, momentum and stuff take time, but as long as you're moving in the right direction, I think 19s league will be a terrific um, boost to the league this year. It adds to the community, I suppose, of it all as well. But from our own point of view, like we were ready for it. We've had three; it's the three years of the 17s league on now. We've been very competitive in them all. We've been right up there. So I suppose this 19s team is nearly a culmination of all those players. I think there's 13 of our senior squads. So we have 23 signed senior players. 13 of them are eligible for the yeah. 19s league. So, yeah. so it'll give you a spread of, you know, where it'll be. So but saying that now, there will be, I think, I think there's 10 of those girls that'll be signed 19s, but there's another 10 behind them that are getting quite close as well. I guess. So I think ultimately for the women's game, to keep progressing and like you'll see this at the higher level like when you see a you know women's world cup squads that you're saying 20 years ago it used to be very much teenagers young 20s and the odd mm. players whereas now a lot of squads are really they might only have one or two players with play under the age of 21 yeah. so i do think that's somewhere the national league will have to go as well is we have to start keeping girls around for longer so we can progress up and get those ages yeah. higher um, big drop-off point for girls in sport, and really, really girls and boys, but girls especially is when they move between primary and secondary school yeah. and when they move between secondary and college. Yeah. So now, obviously, they'd be still able to play 19 football in that move between secondary school and college. So it's great to be getting that level of exposure maintained. And, like, again, Jess is now managing it this year. Jess has been involved with both the seniors and 17, so she knows all the players, and she's really really connected into the club so that's it's another really positive step absolutely look it, it sounds like going from strength to strength which is, which is great i suppose maybe zoning in so in your own team um uh, the, the senior team and looking looking ahead to the to the coming season i, I think your pre-season is well underway at the moment um it's it's in full flow i know that you're training a couple of nights a week and stuff like that um i suppose what is the kind of 
the targets, the plans for the season ahead. I know that you, you've kind of lost a few players, but you've also gained a few players. What are the thoughts in the, within the camp? Just get better, <laughs> Do you know. And like I suppose every year we've been in here, that's the nature of I suppose a young squad, especially because you have players who you're progressing on to, yeah. you know, whether it be a, the USA or whatnot. And like a good sign for us is that players are starting to get to that level more and more often. Do you know so? But I suppose every year we are putting in those continual progressions. But as I said earlier, it gets harder and harder. So um, we're sitting down with the players actually later in the week to finalise those targets for the year. So we'll have to keep them to ourselves for, for the moment. But um, it really is. And the key one we'd always say is, you know, we have this um, video, which all the players are probably sick of hearing, but what is winning? And, you know, winning's been better today than you were yesterday. And that's something we really maintain and try to follow through on. So... We've upped the standard in a few little areas so far. The players' um, reaction to that has been really positive. And if, you know, they are out training more, if the intensity is that bit higher, everything else comes beyond that. I suppose with the squad itself, you know, we've had a lot of stability actually this year. It's probably been our most stable year. Right. We've obviously had a few players come in. Um, so we had Sarah McEvitt's come in. She's a very experienced player. She would have been um, with both uh, P Mountain Wexford Youth Underage International. I remember seeing her myself. First of all, I used to, I took a few sessions with the Kenny Gainer Cup team, just as I'd say seven eight years ago, and she was a player in that. And I remember we were doing a set piece trend. She was whipping in the corner kicks, and I hadn't seen a 13, 14 year old whipping corner kicks of that quality. So I've known for a long time she's had a great right foot. So it's great <laughs> to, be able to get the benefit of that. But I remember then um, she was with the Irish 17s, I think it was, playing in Turner's Cross, and she was terrific that day. So she went to college up around Open Minute. So now she's back around the Munster area. It's great. She's the compound squad. So she's going to give us a lot this year. Again, one of the great things when you bring in players is you want them to be able to suit how we want to play, and we want to be able to get on the ball but play with high energy as well. And that's her to a T, so that's a really positive step. Now, also, obviously, the other place where we have players is players coming up from, you know, the 17s, 19s, the academy. So Leah Hayes was with the squad last year, but I suppose with Maria moving on, Leah's kind of pushing into, um, I suppose, that role. Her and Abby now become our keepers, so um, they're, we're very lucky with that. Leah has a lot of potential, so she's a lot of really good talents as well. She's a super kick of the ball. She's a great frame, you know, so... You know, they're another big plus for us. And then the two girls who've come in around the midfield area, Eva Mangan and Kelly Leahy, who've been in last year's 17s. Oh, right. If anyone watched them perform last year, will know the quality they have as well. And they seem to be really gelling in well with the squad as well. Good stuff, yeah. And um, I suppose just kind of, there's been a lot of positives really Um already this season for for yourselves and and the women's game as a whole just the three teams the three things that stood out to me really I suppose the first thing was the streaming the streaming is a it's a huge uh, development for um I think I think all the leagues really they both the men's for premier first division but also especially I suppose for the for the for the women's league and I know there was that campaign you know can't see can't be kind of thing and you know this kind of brings it to life really doesn't it yeah, like the 20 by 20 campaign yeah. is a really positive thing for women's sport. Like, But that's now, that was a two, three year plan and that's now come to an end. So it's important we start to see things kick on. So I yeah. suppose start 2021 by hearing that all women's national league games will be streamed is, you can't argue with that. That's a really oh. good step to know. And like, I suppose from our own point of view, like our video people between Jacob, Josh, Aaron as well, I know he'll be sick to the teeth of coming in looking <laughs> Other, you know, but um, and I think even to make a statement on that, I think our, our social media stuff last year between Megan and Aaron in particular, you know, Chris O'Mahony does a lot with it as well. Yeah, and um, I think it was really it was it was it was, one of, it was the lead leader even, and if I'd use that term, you know. So um, I know one thing is we always look to be the best in everything we can be, and that was definitely one area we we did really well in and. You know, to add the streaming service, there were some great streams across the league last year. But now to have yeah. the LOI platform is is really good, and I'm looking forward to it. And the pixel art cameras, so it'll be interesting to see how it works. But a really positive development. Yeah, and uh, I suppose just kind of rolling on from that, really, you know, the the development.
that the, the senior women's team will be playing in Turner's Cross this season just even adds to the, you know, the streaming and, you know, aesthetically it's going to look great on, on the camera, you know, the it'll be, a, you know, a proper setup all around, won't it? Yeah, yeah, Asher, Turner's Cross, like, you know, again, I think most players will be coming down looking, when do we play Cork? Because I can't yeah, wait yeah. to play Turner's Cross now and for the girls to be able to play there every second week, it's just brilliant, like, it's, you know, like, it is the home of Cork football, do you know, and yeah. it's great. And again, we're talking about 20 by 20 and, you know, what girls can aspire to. Like, that's going to be our venue now moving forward. I think the work gone in in the back room, both from the club and Aina Buckley in particular, I know a lot of players have done good work with it as well, but the MFA as well to yeah. make it happen, I, I think really, really positive step. We can't wait. Yeah. Like, you know, so. and, uh, I suppose I've been hearing a lot about it because uh, we obviously have uh, Danielle Burke working with ourselves in the marketing yeah. department at the moment as an intern. She's doing some great work, but um, just speaking to her, you know, she's she's been delighted about with the stream, the Turner's Cross. Like you say, I think it's every Cork footballers, whether girls or boys, you know, it's it's always a dream to play in Turner's Cross. And I suppose for the girls now to do it on a, such a regular basis, it'll, it'll be very special, I'm yeah. sure. Like I had one of the girls made said they were at a President's Cup game between um, City and Dundalk and they were in the shed end and there was a goal scored and I remember them saying, you know what, I want to be there and I want to score a goal in the shed end. I said that was two, three years ago. So, yeah. you know, to, and that was one of our senior players, you know, so to even hear them say that and like it's really important to them and, you know, I think it's great. It's really, really, cannot wait, cannot wait. And another big boost, I suppose, for the for the, the senior women's team is the, you know, Jackie Lennox uh, chip shop coming on board um, for the coming three years as, as main sponsor, a huge kind of um, show of support from Brian Lennox and, and the family, you know, to the women's game, to yourselves. It's, you know, it was a fantastic development and, um, you know, another huge step in the right direction for, for the women's game. Yeah, yeah. Ah, well, listen, Brian is another guy who could be one of maybe many that could be called Mr. Cork City. And, you know, to have someone and like, I think everyone in the club, but I think the women's section as well are big, you know, being part of Cork City is really important to us. So to get someone who Cork City is their life as well, you know, to to really back us in that way is terrific, you know. Um, So I can't wait to to we see Brian. He can start coming down to the matches to enjoy him as well because I'm sure he'll be one of our biggest fans. But um, I know we were at the awards ceremony, I think it was two years ago, and Brian would have spoke at it with, um, I think it was, I can't remember two ex-players that were there with him and just hear the passion he spoke about the club with. You know, that's, it's great, yes, to have the sponsorship, but to have people that are that passionate about the club involved as well. And, you know, I suppose thanks to both yourself and Aina as well with that as well. So again, I suppose it shows how everything's coming together, you know, and, you know, I suppose you mentioned Danielle there as well on the sponsorship and, you know, it's great that, you know, players can get that internship, but the great work she's doing as well. So, you know, that big family. That <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I suppose, look, um, just to kind of, you, you know, when you're kicking off the season fixtures and so on and so forth, when you, what are you gearing up for? Um, yeah, no, so we, we've got away in our first game. We're travelling away to Galway. So um, it's always been very competitive. They're a very good team, very well organised, experienced. They've been a good group together, a nice mix of youth. To a certain degree, they'd be kind of like us, I suppose. Right. You know, that kind of, the rural teams taking on the, you know, the other big city teams. So, but... Um, so that'll be one. It's always a fiercely contested contest. So I'm um, looking forward to that. Um, MDC Park's always a great place to go. So that, I suppose, that's our only focus at the moment, you know. So we have two games now between now and then. We play DLR this weekend and we have um, Athlone then the weekend before the season kicks off. Okay. So be- what, what, date, what date is the week? Is the league kicking off just for people who so, might be sure? That's the 27th, so Saturday the 27th. The day after the senior men's uh, core yeah. members match. So I'm sure everyone will be tuned into that's that. That's for the big one that weekend, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, Ron, uh, thanks a million for coming on. Really appreciate you giving your time and giving everyone an insight, not just to the kind of the senior women's team, but the whole senior section as a whole. You're doing some, uh, or the whole women's section as a whole. You're doing some fantastic work there from yourself right down to the coaches. I know that it's hugely kind of volunteer driven also a lot of people in the background there are doing some fantastic work so 
well done to everyone. Keep it up. And, you know, I'm sure it's worthwhile when you see it going from strength to strength. So, so fair play on that front. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. And like, again, I'd just like to reiterate, thanks to everyone from the club, you know, from board, all the employees in the club, our women's committee as well, and all the staff. We're grateful for everything that's going on. So we'll chat again soon. All right. Thanks for that now, Paul. No problem at all. Thanks, Ron. So that brings an end to part two of uh, episode two. Uh, join us after the break, where we'll be joined by amputee manager Dara Collins. Thank you very much. Welcome back to part three of season two, episode two of City Talk. Delighted to be joined now by Dara Collin, the manager of the Cork City FC amputee team. Welcome, Dara. How are you, Paul? How are you getting on? Good, good. I suppose it does been no one kind of affected more than uh, than anyone in the club than, than the amputee team. You're, I suppose, with, with COVID striking this time last year, your whole... Um, so, you know, the season was decimated and, and, and obviously a lot of uncertainties heading into to this year. But, you know, I, I wanted to catch up with yourself just to kind of see how you're getting on. But let's start off, Dara, with tell us a bit about yourself, how you became involved in the amputee team and so on. Well, I suppose I came about, I got involved really through Ronan Collins. Um, Ronan would have been involved in the club that I'm involved in, Balanhasic AFC. So... I would have first met him there. He was coaching underage a couple of years ago. I suppose he knew I had a bit of a, I took a bit of a shine to coaching. So he's been trying to get me involved for ages. Originally it was with the, the girl section that he was running the academy, but I just didn't have enough time. I, I was involved with Panhasic as, as chairman. I was playing at the time I was coaching. So that's it's initially the interest came from there. But when he came to me with the amputee thing before Christmas last year, Last year, he said to me, um, look, would you fancy it? meet the lads? So I met him in fairness. And, uh, you know, the time commitment worked with my schedule, the days they train, the matches and so on. So I said, I'd go for it and, and, and crack in with them. So, you know, that's how I got involved, basically. I came into it initially, I suppose I was picking Ronan's brain because he would have worked with the lads previously um, the odd session. So. Initially, I was kind of like, Ronan, I haven't a clue, man. I have, I've, you know, I'm not an amputee. I don't know anyone in that community or anything like that. Mm. But he said, no, Dar, it's, it's football at the end of the day. It's just small-sided, different little tweaks. But, you know, it's the same thing as an 11-side game, as I say, with those little, little changes. So once I met the lads, <laughs> you realise that actually they're a lot more professional mm. than probably I ever was as a player. Um, so that's, you know... It, it's it's not nothing daunting. It's just football at the end of the day. It's just as I say with those tweaks. So yeah, because I am I, I would have worked obviously with Chris McDormand in the past, mm. who would have been, you know, who did some great work with the amputee team yeah. going back previous years to, to your time. Um, mm. and he, you know, again, I didn't know a huge amount about amputee football at that stage, and he was explaining to me and how the games are, and you know, uh, sounds extremely difficult. Like you know, it's um. He was telling me the lads are proper, you know, fit and ready, and that, you know the games are tough, and they, you know it's not friendly by any means. No, like <laughs> the first away trip we had up to Dublin, I remember we stopped in Mitchellstown and uh, we went into a garage just to get something to eat on the way up, and I got a sandwich and carton of milk or whatever, maybe mm. a pack of crisps or something. The lads had their pre-arranged meals with the protein, the carbs, and I'm looking at them going, okay, I pull up my socks here, I, you know, this is what I'm dealing with. So yeah, yeah, um, I knew then and there that. The professional side of it, I mean, the lads took it dead serious. And they were extremely fit. They were all on programs outside of our training. They were all keeping fit themselves. So I knew I had to kind of pull up my socks and make sure that the sessions were spot on or, you know, or else they'd be calling you out. So they're yeah. ultra professional, yeah. And how was it? Because I know the, um, as I said, going back to Chris, they had some great success there. I think, was it 2017, 18, that they won the, the inaugural tournament of the season and then they went on to play in the Champions League. So big boots to, to fill uh, after that. Massive, massive. Um, again, like I suppose if I had thought of all of that previously, I probably would have panicked and not taken the job. But <laughs> thankfully, Ronan talked me out of it. Um, like, yeah, the, the, the lads were incredibly successful. There was an, I suppose I inherited a strong group. There was a core group of lads there um, that knew the game, that knew the league knew the individuals and the other teams so they helped massively like Dave Saunders and those lads would have helped me along even introducing the rules to me and the timeouts and the you know how the, the actual matches come about so I had great help from those lads they were as I say they had a lot of experience 
Yeah, and I suppose just to kind of give give our listeners a, an idea of, of how it actually works, it's obviously not a 11 a side, it's an asteroid. So give us kind of a yeah. breakdown of how <laughs> a typical amputee match works and the, maybe the rules, regulations and, and stuff. Yeah, like so you have, like, well, first of all, you've played two games in a match day. So they're 15 minutes a half, quick turnaround at half time. Um, so they're, each game is a half an hour in total. You get a timeout in each game. Um, whether it be a tactical reason or just to kill the game or whatever. So you, you can, you, you have the different rules, but it's five aside, uh, one goalkeeper. The difference is the goalkeeper um, tends to have the, the amputation is in the hand. And if he doesn't have a full amputation, they actually strap it. So that's the conditions on the goalkeeper. Whereas the outfield players, they have to be on crutches. And the, obviously the amputation is in the foot and that in, in one of the feet. So right. um, that's pretty much the rules there. Great. And, um, as I said, it's set up on a five-a-side pitch, smaller mm. goals and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, um, yeah. I suppose, you're, it's your typical kind of five-a-side game in that exactly. kind of setup. Great Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And um, I, I suppose going back to kind of, you came in at, was it the start of 2020? Is that when you came on board? Yeah, about about two weeks before the season was due to start. Yeah. Um, I actually, Ronan told me that the lads were training. They were actually training up in the Cope Foundation up in the north side in yeah. Montanati. And uh, so I actually snuck up there one evening uh, just to watch a training session from afar. Um, again, I just wanted to see what the lads were about and what the whole thing was about. Because as I say, you were your, I was yeah. coming in blind. I didn't have a clue um, yeah. about amputee football. So I decided then and there, like, I'll take it on. I'll give it a go. And I had one training session with the lads after that. And then we went into a game week. So it was pretty full on. Yeah, and the, I think just from speaking to you previously before this interview, you said it was it one game weekend that you got last season, which would have consisted of two matches, was it? We got three. So right. I was actually only looking at the calendar la- uh, last night, actually, and we haven't played a game in over a year. So it was the end of February, early March, I think we, we actually, the season was paused. Right. Um, so we had six games in total, three game weekends. So two in Dublin, one in Cork. And uh, I think you also mentioned that you were kind of a lot of, like a lot of regular kind of um, sports teams. You were kind of on and off training then last year, waiting to see if the seasons came back and stuff like that, which unfortunately it didn't come back to this towards the end of last no, year. No. Um, yeah, so we obviously, like, I mean, WhatsApp is a great thing. We keep in touch on a regular basis. Yeah. And just chit-chat or chatting about football or chatting about the league. or Yeah. You know. um, but we did have a couple of training sessions throughout the summer we kind of had an idea then that, you know, things were starting to improve. So we thought we might be back in September, October. Um, but like for me personally, I, I thought it was great to get out. We were out in Bishopstown um, because the weather was so good. So it was great training there. But then obviously things took a turn for the worst of Christmas. And um, yeah. so it basically ended that, you know, yeah. so and it's, been done, tough. it's been tough for the lads. Have you had any communication about a possible kind of, restart to this season or kind of where where is that at at the moment in fairness to the amputee association their communications are outstanding so christy mcgelligan is one of the head men involved and like christy bianchi once every 10 days two weeks and um, the I, I think their intention is to finish the league because it has obviously an effect on champions league places european you know right okay. the league will go on to represent the league in in europe so there is issues around that so they do want to try and finish the season um, I suppose it's because it's there's so few teams in the league, it could be done, um, and hopefully they do finish it. But uh, and they just crack on into the 2021 season then straight after. But uh, we haven't heard anything about the dates or anything. But until we know, you know, and an effort in the government, we won't know. Yeah, and they just kind of I get the feeling there that the, the other kind of uh, countries in regards to MT football are in the same board. Is it? Are they kind of brought to a standstill at the moment as well? Because obviously you couldn't have yeah, some teams going for Europe and others not. Yeah, I think I, the last I heard is that some of the clubs are plowing on with their leagues, that they haven't got the same restrictions as us. Um, I, whether the, the European Association go on and kind of have a season, a Champions League season without the Irish teams or whoever yeah. else can finish their seasons and then maybe introduce, you know, if there's two different winners, they might introduce two Irish teams next year or whatever, I don't know. Um, it's it's all still up in the air a little bit, but the look, that's the same for everyone. It's the same, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say it. So you're kind of 
it's a wait and see scenario for yourselves, obviously. But you're kind of sounds like you're raring to go anyway when uh, when given the go ahead. I uh, absolutely, you know, there's nothing better than playing matches. You know, we we in fairness, the trainings have been enjoyable, and we actually had one before um, before Christmas when the restrictions were a lot easier. Mm. Um, we were able to train in pods, and it was great to get the lads back. But of course, that fell by the wayside um, after the winter break. So. But it is your no. The lads are ready to go. I'm ready to go. We all are, and it's the same for the other teams involved in the league as well. You know, how did they, how did coaching? I suppose there are you know your regular football setup of a life eleven aside and stuff like that. Um, uh, how how does that differ when it comes to kind of coaching amputee players? Is it is there different drills? Is, you know, is it different setup? Is it different types of training? Or how do the you only, kind of customize that? Yeah, the only thing I actually really had to customize because technically the lads are outstanding. I mean, like. T- they are they genuinely are um the only thing that you have to customize is the breaks you have to have more breaks in between because you know yeah. you go around on crutches at normal pace let alone high, high intensity is very tough so that was the only thing i had to introduce and again run on kind of run on collins help you know just talk me through it you know have more regular breaks but do what you want to do in terms of the setup in terms of the session because technically the boys are well able so that's the only thing i really had to adapt Excellent. And uh, I believe that when hopefully when things are back up and running, that you're hoping to kind of maybe recruit some more mm. players. Is that right? Like it's like any dressing room, any team, you have to, you know, keep fellas coming and, and, and girls actually in our case, because it's, it's, it's both male and female. Um, All right. play. Yeah. So um, it's, it's not like I can pick up the phone and ring Paul DC from ring man and say, you know, come out to Balanastic there for a season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's different because obviously the pool is a lot smaller. I'm not an amputee, so I wasn't familiar with, you know, what these procedures are, where to go. Um, but in fairness, again, the league are very helpful in that regards because they would have, uh, I suppose, a dossier of who's who and what areas. So yeah. Christie's helping in Dublin and, and um, the club have been brilliant. Aina is in, in constant communication with us about what we can do, how we can help, social media and all that. So once we get going, hopefully we'll be able to put some kind of PR, PR drive behind it, you know? Yeah, and I suppose, look, for anyone that's listening to this, Dara, if there mm. is someone out there that is interested when things are going to get a, get going again, how mm. would they get a, get in touch with yourselves or what would they do if they want do want to come out maybe to train or go for the training? Yeah, whatever? well, like the, tra- the training sessions, provided the restrictions allow us, will be open to everyone. Um, right. So, and obviously just get in touch with the, the, the Facebook page. They can get in touch via me, via email or whatever. You know, yeah. it's out there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's there's no end to how they can communicate, and it, it is an open platform. You, you don't know if you're able to do it until you try. So, like our intention is absolutely open doors. You know, come out, give it a go. If you don't like it, it's not for you. Fair enough, but no harm done. Give yeah. it a try. You know. Yeah, so maybe we can direct people there to the to the club email, the info mm-hmm. at corkcityfc.e. If anyone has an interest in in getting involved or uh, interest in playing or coming up and have a look and um, just drop an email and, and the club will forward on yourself. That sounds good. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely okay. brilliant. Yeah. Look, Dara, thanks again for coming on. I know you did just not a huge amount to update us on amputee no, football no, at no, the no. current state, unfortunately, like a lot of areas, but um, really appreciate you coming on. Gives a bit of background about yourself and, and I suppose the plans for the, for the amputee team going forward and, and the great work you're, you're doing there. Keep it up. Brilliant, Paul. Nice one. Cheers, mate. No problem. Man. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so that brings an end to Season 2, Episode 2 of City Talk. Uh, thank you very much to Liam Kearney, Ronan Collins and Dara Collin for coming on board. Um, this episode is brought to you in association with Red FM. Thank you to Aaron Howie on production. We also have our Fantasy Cheltenham fundraiser running at the moment. So you go to fantasycheltenham.e. It's €20, Euro, which cover you for the four days of racing. It's a, a fundraising initiative for the club. Make sure you click Cork City FC when you are signing up. And again, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs>